Welcome to Paul or Nothing, the place to get all of your Paul all of the time. Join me, your host Sam Wiles, as we discover the history, the music, and the man behind it all, Paul McCartney. To get in contact with the show, email us at paulmccartneypod at gmail.com. It can sometimes be quite difficult, really, telling people that you run a Paul McCartney-based podcast, as it can quite often come across as a tad uncool in a variety of crowds and situations. Now, whilst working on my last podcast, Down in the Hole, I was more than happy to accept the fact that people were not even going to have heard of Tom Waits, let alone concern themselves whether about I think he's cool or not. But Wings were absolutely massive, both in the UK and worldwide, yet they haven't aged so well. McCartney, though, seems to be ever more vogue with, with each passing year, but there has never been any love for a return to Wings. They had five number one albums in a row in America, and Band on the Run was the highest selling album in the UK in 73, and yet no one and yet no one seems to give them any airplay anymore, listen to them, and just give them their fair dues. The fact that Alan Partridge is their biggest fan, dubbing them the band the Beatles could have been, is more than enough evidence to show that Wings are anything but in style right now. There are, of course, a multitude of reasons behind this. First of all, there is still a ton of baggage left over from the earlier Wings lineups. You know, before Band on the Run, when the band were a little more rough around the edges, shall we say. This view of the band as one of few hits and a shambolic lineup is outdated yet seemingly impossible to shift despite their latter successes. And there seems to be a regurgitation of this view without an effort to critically evaluate the music fairly or even just listen to it. What doesn't help with this is McCartney's distancing of himself from the band in recent years and poo-pooing their successes in the media. Another reason was their ever-present accusation of being softcore and lightweight. Now, the problem with this stereotype like many stereotypes, is that the bassist is somewhat based in truth. To some extent, the band were overly sentimental, and they did have too many pop ballads, lacking that edgier core rock sound, and they did have a bad habit of writing one too many love songs with naff lyrics. But isn't that what makes them wings in the first place? Now, whilst Paul would go so far as to relent to the ever-changing times with his fusion of new wave and punk on Back to the Egg, as well as going full techno for McCartney too. What we instead see around this period that we'll be delving into today, you know, we're going to be discussing Wings at the Speed of Sound, is that Wings seem to double down on the cornier aspects of what made them Wings to begin with. And I love that. What makes Wings Over the World and today's album, Wings at the Speed of Sound, so distinctive, especially for this period, is just how much they overcame or just didn't care about what was cool and what was good taste at the time. These two albums, especially the one we're going to be discussing today, are defined middle fingers, or V two fingers for the Brits, right back at the ever more aggressive and extreme music scene at the time. This is not the Sex Pistols, folks. This is, you know, warm and beautiful. And we really should revel in this sort of stuff from Paul. We really should, because after this time of Wings loving themselves for who they are and what they are, you know, a cheesy pop band, we're going to get things like London Town and Tug of War and Pubs of Peace, which is... An era, for better or worse, where Paul will start actively trying to make us like him. Hello! Finally, hello and welcome to another episode of Paul or Nothing, the world's premier Paul McCartney podcast where we dissect, evaluate, occasionally moan about, but more importantly, immerse ourselves in the music, the life and the story of Paul McCartney. This is our eighth official episode now in this ongoing saga, and as always, I'm glad to be back here today, folks. Sorry this one's taken so long, it's been an annoying complication involving file loss, busy work schedule, getting let go from a job, and all of this, you know, all this personal stuff has kept me away, but fortunately for you, that is no more. This will be the first proper episode we've had in a while. Now, our last full album review was with Mr. Kenneth Womack, where we spent something like three hours talking about Venus and Mars. Brilliant episode, super in-depth. Please check it out if you already haven't. And today was kind of meant to be something similar. This was meant to be an episode where I was going to be joined by a co-host to review Wings at the, at the Speed of Sound, namely Luca Perezzi, who we had on our very first bonus episode all those, not years, months ago. So rather than butchering this episode in an attempt to fit Luca in with our relevant time schedules, what I've decided to do is to separate that little self-contained chat I had with Luca, with what spare time he had, and that will be the next bonus episode. It'll be the companion piece to this one. So please check out all of that. We always love hanging out with Luca here on the show and it was great to get some top-rate wings chat with him once again, even if it was for far too short a time. 
One other quick thing I wanted to say before we started here, folks, was to plug my recent appearance on another musical podcast. Yes, please check out my guest spot on Alpha Metallica, a super exciting Metallica-based pod hosted by my own ex-co-host and good friend of the show, Mr. Tom Quee, where he is, as you may have guessed, going through every song by the father of all metal bands. In alphabetical order. Duh. The song in question that we covered was the title track from their monumental 1988 release, And Justice For All. It was a super exciting episode to, to be a part of. I had a great time. And we actually recorded it before we did our Wings Over America episode, which will also be out very soon. Yes, sir. I don't necessarily record these in order, but keep your eyes peeled for that one. And now on to a brief word from our sponsors. And by sponsors, I mean me. As always, you can get in contact with the show by contacting us on email at paulmccartneypod at gmail.com. Anything you want to say about the show, whether you want to sing my praises or damn me straight to hell. Maybe you've met Paul. Maybe you play his music. Maybe you've read something about him that, that might be interesting. Maybe there's a fact that only you know and no one else does. Or you might even just want to say hi. I want to foster this community. I have fun receiving your emails and your messages whenever I get them. It's always wonderful correspondence and I'd love to read it out on the show. You send me something in, I'll read it out. Fantastic. You can also contact me in a much more direct manner on the Twitter, which is at McCartney Pod, the place where I just post all things Paul. I get, I get to chat to you, put polls up, which I have endless fun with. All of that stuff, great fun. You can also check out the blog, which is at uh, paulmccartneypod.wordpress.com, uh, www. should I say, paulmccartneypod.wordpress.com, where we actually finally have put out the first article. Yes, I've been talking about this for months. It's going to be a weekly thing where I'll be putting out an article about Paul, about Wings, where I really couldn't fit it into a regular episode. Think of it like Tolkien's appendices at the end of The Return of the King. Anything I couldn't quite naturally fit into the flow, I'll write up into an article instead. I had great fun doing it, and the first one that's up there now is my attempt to rebuild Red Rose Speedway, taking it from its single album re release to its rightful place as The Wings' double album. Let me know what you thought about that in the comments section. And upcoming on the blog, we'll be having my article. We'll be discussing Paul's relationship with John via the medium of analysing the songs that he directed personally towards John. Check us out on Facebook by typing in Paul or Nothing in, in, into the search bar and do the same on YouTube, but also type in Paul McCartney Podcast. We might come up a little bit quicker. Uh, something I've been begging for you for ages, of course, is the iTunes reviews. I'm not particularly sure how they work, but whenever you give us a nice review, that'll push us up in the rankings, as it were, giving us that much-needed exposure and allowing our community to grow, essentially. So please, if you could take 10 seconds just to go to iTunes, give us a quick five-star review, even at, well, you know, I could accept a four-star one. But if you want to help out the show in a big way, please join us on our Patreon page. Yes, folks, we have set up a Patreon page. You've probably downloaded the Patreon episode that I released just a short while ago where I went into much more detail about what you can give to the show and what the show can give back to you because of the Patreon. We're not going to be doing much exclusive Patreon content. It will always be for free for all of you listeners out there for you to enjoy. But hey, if you think the show that I'm giving you today is worth $1, maybe a dollar a month if you're feeling cheeky, then please check out the Patreon. Link will be provided in all future episodes from now on, even retroactively, which is the best thing about Podbean. I can go back and add links and stuff. But yeah, please check out the Patreon page, folks. It's the best place to help the show grow, to help us tech up the show a little bit, and maybe even help us bank a couple of bigger guests in the future. But enough of that. Let's crack on with Paul's life. I mean, where were we? Uh, by the time we actually get to the eve of this tour, Paul has been working his balls off, making sure there is no stone left unchecked. He has meticulously built this top-of-the-line travelling show for six years by this point, and all that slow burning is going to start paying off. He has the songs to support the set list, he has the band, a band that he's rehearsed with, travelled with, and together they released a well-received follow-up to Band on the Run. So everything seems to be in order. What could go wrong? And then something happens that even Paul McCartney couldn't prepare for. Just two days before the Wings' second European leg of their tour, Paul's father, Jim McCartney, dies of pneumonia. It seems like Jim was destined to have a boy like Paul. Joe McCartney, Jim's father, Paul's grandfather, was also a fan of music, though much more of a tr traditionalist who liked though much more of a traditionalist who liked opera, who liked the opera and played an E flat tuba at, in the local territorial army band. He also played the double bass at home, sang and hoped to interest his children in music. Jim, himself, learned how to play the trumpet and piano by ear alone, and by the age of 17, started playing ragtime music. The warm, damp conditions of post-war freedom and such established musicality within the McCartney family and household was the perfect breeding ground for a powerful pathogen like Paul to fully develop. 
fight off all antibiotics and create his own music. Paul had written music for his dad as early as 1966 when he turned his little 1958 melody, When I'm 64, into the classic side two track on Sgt. Pepper, an album released the year Jim McCartney turned 64. Paul's obvious sentimentality and fond feelings towards his father is reflected frequently throughout his discography, whether in the abstract, you just consider you know, his pub, showroom, vaudeville, family piano influence, or in the most literal sense, when Paul recorded his father's tune, Walking in the Park with Eloise, a song he released under the pseudonym The Country Hams, which was recorded during the Nashville sessions two years prior. Paul loved his father and looked after his dad well later into his life and was also fiercely protective of him and his interests after he became famous. Racehorses, Tudor estates, fast cars, little Paulie had done alright by his old man with his pop songs, especially to a man who up until 1964 had been earning just £10 a week. Now what Paul does next here is very telling of the man he is, very telling of the kind of man he is, and what he sees as the kind of man that he thinks he should be in order to be successful in this, in this business. Paul made the untimely decision not to stay in England after his father's death, but to instead carry on with the tour. On the 22nd of March 1976, when Paul and his new band were travelling between sellout gigs in Berlin and Copenhagen, Jim was buried in Merseyside at a small funeral with his family. Perhaps the lack of Paul's presence was actually a gift in disguise, as it meant that the media would leave the family in peace. Now, I'm sure there are many people out there who feel as if Paul should have cancelled the dates or even just delayed the tour, but you have to consider that, A, I'm sure Paul is well aware of this and would obviously rather have been home with his family and will have to bear that burden in his own way for the rest of his life, and B, you also can't just cancel tours like this. You know, these things are huge grinding machines of capitalism. You know, you can't even slow them down. Venues don't, ha don't have spare dates for you, so the pressure that Macca was surely under to slog it and carry on by the corporate body would have just been immense. He would have had to carry on smiling for the cameras, playing for the people, you know, the show goes on. And it did. The tour was to carry on without delay. Unfortunately, this would not be the only tragic death that would strike close to home for Paul. Mal Evans first met Paul after little George Harrison had suggested to the owner of the cavern that he become the club's new bouncer. From then on, Mal, the gentle giant, was a staple face in the Beatles' entourage, guiding them everywhere from the US to India as their newly appointed road manager. His credits also include playing the anvil on Maxwell's Silver Hammer and playing the infamous alarm clock on A Day in the Life. In Barry Miles' seminal book Many Years From Now, Paul himself tells a little amusing little anecdote about Mal during the recording of Being for the Benefit of Mr Kite. I remember we had one thing that required a sustained organ note, so I said, Mal, look, that's the note, I'll put a little marker on it. When I say go, hit it, which he did, and I said, when I shake my head, take your finger off. So, for that kind of part, it was very youthful. Since the breakup of the band, the ever-loyal Mal lost both a sense of self and a sense of direction, really. He had lost his main source of income and the reason to keep working, and now found himself on the outside of the circle of fame and fortune. By 76, things had already begun to take a turn for the worse for Mal, you know, both financially and socially. He was in dire straits with money, and he was living a semi-isolated existence in LA. Eventually, a friend of Mal's called the police to say he was doped up and on Valium, and pacing around his apartment with, with a gun. The police arrived at 8122 West 4th Street in LA, and when they saw Mal with a gun, you see the news every day. No surprises for guessing how this turned out. Mal died before he even hit the ground from four bullet-shaped holes tearing through his body. Again, in that same book, many years from now, Paul once again talks about Mal. Mal was a big lover of a bear of a roadie. He'd go over the top occasionally, but we all knew him, and we never had any problems. Had I been there, I would have been able to say, Mal, don't be silly. In fact, any of his friends could have talked him out of it without any sweat. Because he was not a nutter. George Harrison arranged for Evans' family to receive £5,000 as Evans had not maintained his life insurance premiums and was not entitled to a pension. It does make you wonder just how many people, whether embedded deep in the heart of Apple Corps to the most peripheral figures in the Beatles story, eventually either got lost from the path or wandered too far from it after the band's demise. They were an industry and, and just like closing down a mining town in Lancashire, there will always be those left behind when the show's over. Now, I'm not accusing the Beatles of Mal's death because they couldn't just stay together for him forever. It's just a shame that they, he couldn't get his life together in time. That being said, and, you know, you conspiracy buffs out there will like this one, especially those who are still disappointed with the fact that Paul is, in fact, not dead. When Mal was gunned down by the ever-reputable American police forces, he was actually on the eve of publishing a very frank and very candid 
open biography covering his entire time with the Beatles, which was certainly to be filled with all sorts of debaucherous backstage tales of rock, sex and drugs. Perhaps it was a little too much of an expose, who knows? Maybe Mel took some dirty little Beatles stories to his grave. I'm telling you, he probably knows where the original Paul was buried and they silenced him. I'll end this little section with a quote from Howard Soons, who, as I mentioned, we had on the show a while back. In his book Fab, he says, Mal must have known the Beatles didn't want him to publish that book, and that choice he faced was dropping the project and losing money, or further estranging himself from the boys. Perhaps better to die. Hands Across the Water, the first half of the tour. Now, for a band who were so notoriously better live than they were on vinyl, Wings seemingly had very little touring time, especially for a band with an ex-Beatle. I mean, the band was made out of the very ashes of Paul wanting to get the Beatles back on the road in the first place. So it seems just so odd that, even despite the changing lineups, they weren't a one-tour-every-year kind of group. When Wings were still in their relative infancy, the tours were nothing more than fascinating little time capsules that showed just how the band was maturing at any one moment. We had the little rustic, intimate, shambolic Wings University tours, the escapist retreat of the Wings Over Europe tour, and the fizzle more than a bang UK tour in 1973, so it's only fitting that the band embark on a journey that will pretty much make up for all of those tours combined and put everything in place and force everything they'd done previously into a much lower league. If Band on the Run and Venus and Mars had turned Wings into a proper band, well then they were going to have to have a proper tour to match. One thing I will say is that for all intents and purposes, the first half of the Wings Over the World Tour is the Australian stuff because it is the only part of the tour that was widely documented and saved for the ages as well as being the most described in the literature. So. When talking about this first half of the tour, the Wings Over the World tour, I am mostly going to be referring to the Australian leg of it. So unless anyone out there can find me a bootleg or something, I'll be forced to stick to this. Uh, all I can find is some random Euro trash interviews with Paul on regional TV. Uh, when they did land in Australia, though, they arrived to the knowledge that at least 1,500 people had camped overnights to get tickets to their show the next day. And in rather Fab Four fashion, they were swamped at Perth Airport, presumably by ex-cons and koalas. I'm only being mean because my good chum Maurice is an Aussie and I'll be having him on in a couple of episodes time to discuss London Town. Then he also had his 31st birthday over there as well, which just highlights their massive commitment such a world tour entails. So the group set off on the 9th of September 1975 with their first gig at the Gourmand Theatre in Southampton. And shockingly enough, nothing went wrong. Every show was a smash sellout with the masses of media following them at every turn and screaming fans lined the street like Paul was visiting royalty. And this positivity, as Linda points out in a second, helped keep up the momentum for such a long tour. She continues, This tour has been very good to him. It's very much been the most positive thing to happen to him in years, and he very much works on positive vibes. When it's possible, he flowers. Obviously, this goes against my theory that Paul works better when he's upset, but hey, she has to live with the guy, so I can forgive her for that. However, on the flip side of all this, you can never underestimate the underlying sense of self-doubt and nervousness that Paul must have been feeling, who, the last time he did a world tour, he had three other bandmates on his level ready there to support him. And this time he was really just resting on him solely. If this went tits up, it would be his reputation on the line, not the band's. And don't forget, whilst Paul is no stranger to adulation, Wings has been a bumpy ride at the best of times, with both audiences and critics, so it's understandable why Paul may be apprehensive about this whole tour. Anything could throw him off. There are stories of you know him being so nervous he's driven to distraction, like anything such as a late lighting cue or an audience member leaving to go for a cigarette would leave Paul frantic and he would just be upset that, that he wasn't giving the crowd the perfect show. But he had many things in his favour. The first thing that they had was a slick new set list to support them. The two new albums, plus their extensive list of singles, was more than enough to bloat the show to a respectable two plus hours in length. Meaning that the wait for a good tour, or in some people's cases, a tour of Wings at all, would be, from Paul and the band, would be atoned for with a real value for money gig. Now, many people may have skipped ahead and noticed that on Wings Over America, our next episode, that several of the songs on that set list are actually from the very album we are reviewing here today. And you'll be right. Instead, so what did they play during the Wings Over the World tour before this album came out? Well, instead, we have songs like Little Woman, Little Love, Sea Moon, and Junior's Farm to round out the show. And for me, as far as I'm concerned, gives the setlist a decidedly more Wings feel. It was a lot more inclusive of their broader catalogue, of their back catalogue. It seemed to appeal to those long-time fans frothing at the mouth for this kind of stuff. Hey, you know, there's no bit bop or big barn bed, but, but it's better than just chucking on the four least terrible songs from the latest album and chucking it onto no side for no reason. But hey, more on that at the end of this episode and the next one. 
One thing that McCartney has always had much success with on the road is his ability to iron out creases in songs that he clearly has a blast playing. Worked in the studio, but for whatever reason, just didn't stick the landing on the albums, on the vinyl. So instead, he actually improves them for stage, giving us a, a, a much more official version. You know, this is the way it's meant to be played. And for the most part, these songs are improved by one method and one method alone. Cranking every song up by about 30% on the rock factor. Every song is usually louder, denser, distinctly quicker in pace, and has the band just give it some good old-fashioned welly, both musically and vocally. Good examples of this would include 1985, Little Woman, Little Love, and You Gave Me the Answer. This live tour, this live tour would also be rather democratic for the band. I mean, compared to earlier wing shows, at, at least, where it really was the Paul McCartney show, instead now we have Denny Lane, getting uh, four or five lead vocals, depending on where you are in the tour, and newcomer Jimmy McCulloch getting a chance to sing too. It made the group seem more, well, like a group for a change. Wings was a band that worked best when each member of the band contributed in some way, and here they exploit that to the nth degree, and it works. It pays off. Japanese Tears. The Cancellation. It's safe to say that it, that it is somewhat wider knowledge that the big controversy with Wings and Japan is that the band broke up after Paul was arrested and jailed for weed possession in 1980. The first leg of the Wings world tour was actually meant to be significantly longer, with a Japanese leg of the tour rounding things off before resting, breaking and taking on the USA. However, it seems that McCartney's seemingly never-ending encounters with the law over smoking that super dank green were about to catch up with him once more. Seemingly out of the blue, really. Just because Paul had thus far avoided any actual jail time over his past marijuana offences did not mean he was off the hook by any stretch of the imagination. Even during the doped up decade that was the 1970s, drug enforcement agencies and lawmen the planet over were keen to keep an eye on people with any past drug offences, to make sure no other countries and moral druggies could come in and poison their own society. Let us not forget that, despite the huge stone of subculture, the public were, uh, as well as the legislative perception, of sparking a joint was much more negative than it is today. We're only a generation away from the propaganda scare films like Reefer Madness, and there is no internet, and weed in pop culture was still under the surface and subversive. So it's no surprise that people took sneaking in a bit of grass in through customs as a very serious matter. It's stupid, but understandable. So, as Wings was just about to embark on the Japanese leg of their tour, the Minister of Justice from Japan basically sent them a letter saying, we're not having you, we're not granting you work visas, we're not granting you tourist visas, you're not coming in, end of. This must have thrown the tour into a complete disarray. Paul must have been completely tearing his hands out. And to this day, it just seems such, such a pity that such an innocuous thing like an ex-Beatle, an MBE holder no less, being punished so gratuitously for a crime that he didn't even commit. It, you know, it's, it's a past offence, it's so blatantly stupid. Admittedly, he weaseled out of the majority of repercussions for those offences, but it's almost like certain officials are seeking to make a name for themselves and are just hounding any chance to throw the book at a high-profile celebrity. It just doesn't even make economic sense either. The sheer amount of commerce that would come into the country from ticket sales, transport, food, drink, album sales, merchandise and publicity would have seemingly been limitless, especially considering just how long it had been since Paul played there, which was now over a decade ago. Speaking on the issue in Melody Maker, McCartney attempts to conceal his contempt for the Japanese drug laws. It was the Minister of Justice's fault. I suppose he'd say it was my fault for having smoked some of the deadly weed. But we had our visa signed by the London Japanese Embassy. Everything had been cleared. And we were in Australia, just about a week from going to Japan, when this little note arrived saying that, that the Japanese Minister of Justice says no. It was just one of those things, but we all felt sick about it. However, the cancellation of the Japanese tour meant the group was free to vacation. Paul taking his family and the band to Hawaii, where he would start making plans on the next album. The last time he had a low point due to a drug bust, we got banned on the run, so hey, you know, anything's possible. Paul swiftly issued an apology to his Japanese fans, though you could tell he was both clearly enjoying the cheeky infamy the event was causing, as well as holding back some of his more vitriolic opinions. We're very sorry that we didn't get to come to Japan and play our music this time, but if the Minister of Justice says we can't come in, then we can't come in. Don't worry, we'll see you next time when we come back to your beautiful country. Sayonara. A very fitting quote indeed for a band that would ultimately break up after another Japanese drug bust. Just to put things into perspective as to how popular Paul and the Beatles were, even to this day, in Japan, there are more Beatles and Wings tribute bands than America and Europe combined. That's a whole lot of fake Ringos and fake Lindas.
So once again, just on the verge of a massive success, the tour was hit. Another minor setback that's, that uh, stunted this tour, albeit a more minor one, was when, and it depends on who, who you ask about this, when lead guitarist Jimmy McCulloch broke his left forefinger, thus utterly ruining any upcoming shredding he may have been planning, which delayed the tour for another whole month. Several sources I have read, and perhaps the more Macca PR friendly story, is a description of a young Jimmy falling out of the bath and snapping his digit in Paris. But a couple of other books that I was perusing directly state that he got into a rather savage fist fight with an as of yet unnamed American TV star and recording artist and in the scuffle broke his finger. Perhaps having McCartney as legal backup may have saved the notoriously rambunctious McCulloch in this instance, though his luck wouldn't last forever. So after writing that segment, I read another book called Man on the Run, Paul McCartney in the 1970s, where author Tom Doyle goes into even more detail on this story. He says that the encounter was when Jimmy, Denny and uh, Jeff Britton were drinking very heavily and bumped into then teen heartthrob David Casty and went so far as to get into some sort of squabble, call him a fag and get into fisticuffs with him. Wow, that's a little bit twatty, Jimmy, isn't it? You never know, cocaine could be a part of this. He could have been doing a few bumps with Jojo Lane and maybe, you know, he, he just lost his head and attacked him. But who knows how it ultimately went down. David Casty's own website states that McCulloch broke his finger whilst wrestling with him. Paul, in an interview around that time, was probably venting a certain frustration when he said, It's fine, and we'll break his arm next week. Whether Paul or was joking or not is entirely up for debate. This three-week delay must have really incensed the ex-Beatle, and I'm sure he saw it as him having to handle this young kid just before the gig of his lifetime, on the brink of his you know, final post-Beatle validation and success. The thing he's been building up for five years and has an estimated £40 million in potential profits, and then that same young upstart goes and royally fucks it all up by breaking his finger. The amount of bad press that they, they, they would have had to have spurred would have been enormous. Very much like Henry McCulloch throwing up on the set of the My Love music video, this may very well have been the incident that, whilst not breaking the camel's back, indicated to McCartney that Jimmy was a bit of a piss artist and he might not be around for the entire length of Wings. Recording the album. The fact that the band had no longer had to go to, to Japan meant they had plenty of time to dick around, or as Wings called it, recording a new album. Wikipedia says it was recorded in about six weeks. Another says they started in October and finished in February, though I struggle to find the source. Either way, compared to the last few recordings for the band, especially things like Red Rose Speedway, it's safe to say that Wings at the Speed of Sound was recorded very quickly. Very quickly indeed. In fact, the recording process of the album is much more akin to the likes of Wildlife, more than anything, except this time Paul had, on the face of it at least, a much more competent and cohesive band that he that had played together and knew how to make a record together. Now, there have been some allegations right from the get-go that the album was a bit of a rush job, and whilst that is kind of apparent in the music, the production, and general tone, I think it's unfair to say it was rushed, and it's probably better to say that they had deadlines to keep, and Paul could hardly be on top of his writing game whilst doing Wings Over the World, so perhaps the, the songwriting just didn't have enough time to grow and mature into something a little more substantial. Unlike previous sessions, though, there were no exotic locations in far-off distant countries. The whole thing was recorded, mixed and produced by McCartney at EMI Studios in London, the Beatles' old hideaway. The album cover, uh, the album cover is pretty poo actually, it's quite reflective of the rather lukewarm receptions that people gave to the album. It was designed by Hypnosis, who had gone to design the Wings Over America album cover, we get on to a little more about who Hypnosis were in that episode, but extending that kind of rushed metaphor, you know, the album was quickly mocked up, the album cover does reflect that somewhat. It had no gatefold sleeve, lyrics on the back, or any other extras. The photo on the front was of lettering on the marquee in front of Leicester Square the Theatre in London. At the time it was taken, though, it actually, it actually didn't say Wings at the Speed of Sound. It was actually a photograph of the cinema showing The Return of the Pink Panther, starring Peter Sellers. The rear photo covers were taken by the guy who did the front cover for Band on the Run, Clive Arrowsmith. And, and, it's, and it's essentially kind of a Hard Day's Night kind of mock-up where all the band have lots of different photos off their faces making a variety of different poses but they're all blurred into each other rather than being like these separate still images. And images on the inside and the inner sleeve were, of course, as always, taken by Linda. Critical Reception American critic Robert Meltzer, who reportedly never liked the group from the get-go, hilariously dubbed Wings at the Speed of Sound as a very homogeneously tinkle-tinkle album, and that the whole thing was a major disappointment, with music that was a predictable drone featuring rocking chair music. Cream magazine also gave a similarly stale and standoffish review. They said, The only substantial talent in this group is Paul McCartney, and he is at full singing and composing strength only during the impassioned Beware My Love. 
The supporting cast is disgracefully third-rate, and it is my feeling that the vocals of Denny Lane are even lamer than those of Linda's, who at least fits nicely as a background singer. Then again, this might simply reflect McCartney's cunning as a producer. He certainly adds some tricky textures to otherwise forgettable songs, but that can't hide their triviality. Now, to say that this album has somewhat of a bad reputation is somewhat of an understatement. Don't get me wrong, I scour the forums, I check the Reddit posts and the Twitter polls, and it's immediately clear that this album does have its fans and its ever stalwart defenders. But even to the most resolute Wings fan, whether they like it or not, has to come to terms with the fact that on a purely musical level, this is not the best thing Wings ever put out. I hardly imagine it is in anyone's top three Wings albums, or anyone's top five McCartney albums for that matter. And that's okay. We always knew that this show was not going to be Ram or Band on the Run every episode, and we just have to carry on really, and carry on being objective and salvaging what we can. Now, you're probably thinking I'm going to be overly harsh on this album, and spoiler alert, I really won't be. Partly because McCartney's my bread and butter, and I don't ever want to piss him off too much, but mostly because that there were that there were several songs on this album that became immediately fond of the first time I listened to it, which is more than I could say for Red Rose Speedway, which I now look back on much more fondly. Again, check out my article on www.publicgotnipod.wordpress.com where I talk about Red Rose Speedway. Or maybe, you know, I'm just becoming too desensitised to this sort of thing. The most notable and most well-known review of this period was written by Stephen Holden for Rolling Stone in 76. Clearly a McCartney fan through and through, he was still overall, again, lukewarm when it comes to heaping too much praise. But it's what he says here where he lost me. He says, Wings at the Speed of Sound ostensibly invites the listener to spend the day with McCartney and Wings, a day in which the listener is, is gently harangued as well as entertained. So like he tries to start this whole idea where like, the whole album is a day with the McCartneys. So, you know, we have Let Them In... Um, where we're welcomed by the, the McCartney Wings quote-unquote family and then we get to know each character display a certain side of themselves. You know, it's very social. You get to know everyone. Linda's the cook of the house. Denny sings a song. Joe English sings a song. Uh, but remember our round episode where I kind of mentioned how fans will find any old rubbish inside an album if they want to find it and can create theories to suit facts rather than facts to suit theories? This is just that. I really feel like this is some Room 237 levels of looking too deeply into something that is generally almost all surface so almost all surface and even if it was true this so-called hidden concept of the album almost certainly failed as the songs sadly feel too disjointed and unorganized as a whole to sustain it however he somewhat redeemed himself for me at the end of his review when he almost can't keep up the pretense any further and suddenly becomes very frank about this album's shortcomings and i don't think i will be able to top the way he sums it up when he says while there is much to admire on Wings at the Speed of Sound, it is contained in the production more than the material. Ultimately, this album lacks the melodic sparkle of Venus and Mars, which in turn lack the energy, passion and structural breath and unity of Band on the Run, Wings' finest album. No one rocker on speed matches the spirit of Jet or Band on the Run from Band, while no ballad even begins to approach the majesty of My Love from Red Rose Speedway. The tone of the album... There were several uh, notes and press cuttings that were, that were released for this album, very much like McCartney's first album, and they paint a surprisingly distant and detached picture between the band and the album. These were found at maca-central.com, which is a great website, you know, just a host of a huge McCartney-based emporium of information. But this is mostly played out in the interviews with everyone who isn't a McCartney, which again isn't surprising. Joe English said, We weren't in an aggressive mood when we made the record. I mean aggressive to the point where you say, well, we got to knock them dead, show them how heavy we are. There's a little subtlety on this one instead. He continues by attempting to use one of the most tepid and boring and useless excuses for making an album that failed to meet certain critical expectations. He attempts to pass the buck somewhat when he says, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed recording it. I think Silly Love Songs and Wano Junko and the song that I sing, Ball's Last Ballad, at the end are real classics. We were enjoying ourselves. Oh, so it's like one of those films whereby everyone on the set was enjoying themselves, but ultimately the audience will never enjoy the final product. He even then tries to pass it off as the band attempting to adopt the reverse attitude of Venus and Mars' work ethic when he says, We aim to record a good record that you can sit down and listen to and hear a good stereo mix. We also had it in our heads that we were you know, about to go on tour, so, we you know, We'd make life easy. Then, if that's not enough, in a final panic, he then decides to go all etu brute on McCartney as he non-directly throws him under the bus for all the album shortcomings. We'd go into the studio, hear a number, play it through, and when we were hot, we'd cut it. We made all those suggestions in the mixing, but Paul made all the final decisions. It's no secret that a lot of people who may have been a little bit here and there with Venus and Mars not have their fears put to rest with wings at the speed of sound. The album's backlash was almost instantaneous, and it still felt to this day by large swathes of the fan base. 
However, some folks say balls to all that and they declare Wings and the Speed of Sound to be one of the band's better albums. But again, it's not quite top three, is it? Though, when I read one guy or gal who said that it was better than Band on the Run, I knew there had to be some fuckery going on there and I promptly ignored it. Now, despite the fact that the album contains the critical rebuke that is silly love songs, there's still an awful lot of sentimental McCartney filler on this album that would do nothing to ease the minds of those who saw McCartney as lightweight. You would be hard pressed to make any argument that songs like She's My Baby, Warm and Beautiful, or even the two singles are at all edgy or cool when compared with his rock contemporaries. It is around here now where, in his mid-thirties, Paul may be beginning to lose his ability to connect with a youthful audience, something he was constantly questioned about on the press circuit for this tour. So, I hope I haven't spoiled anything too much. Like Again, like I say, I'm really not going to be ripping too deeply into this album, but it is flawed. So I think the best thing to just do is to compose ourselves and crack on with the songs, shall we? The first song on our list was, for the longest time, the only song I ever actually knew off the album. It's a song that reminds you of warm and of home and of love and all of those classical McCartney emotional cues. And it has that Uncle Albert charm that just makes you bloody proud to be British. This song is Let Em In. Someone knocking at the door Somebody ringing the bell Someone's knocking at the door Somebody's ringing the bell Do me a favour Open the door and let him in. Ooh, yeah. My relationship with this song, as with eleven other tracks, goes all the way back along goes all the way back to the Wings' greatest compilation album, which for me was the perfect window into the band, and it, along with Band on the Run, sold me the whole band entire. It comes in rather late on the release, following High 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 and preceding My Love. I always remembered this one capturing my attention and became one of the songs I was most attached to. I was drawn to that quasi old fashioned sound that the song evokes and the genius of this song was instantly clear to me. It's just so damn simple. The composition is simple, the lyricism is simple, the melody is simple, everything is stripped down, bare bones, and is constructed and you can tell the confidence of McCartney going into this one. It really is one of those tracks that you can really build an album around. Like He knows that this one's going to sell. Again, it's that root core of a melody that McCartney can tap into that does essentially allow him to coast on albums like this, but when he does have a good idea and some spirit in the recording, we get something pretty damn reasonable like this. As we mentioned earlier, Paul has confessed that the recording sessions for this album were amongst the quickest Wings ever did, so it makes sense to place one of the obviously stronger tracks right at the start to give the album a good jumping off point to give you a little bit of confidence going in. As far as concepts for opening songs for albums go, it's both very on the nose and yet still incredibly warm and charming. I think most people pretty quickly understand that this is a big old McCartney warm musical hug. He's welcoming us back in, into the fold, catch up with the band since Venus and Mars. Since the very first days of Beatles songwriting, songs like Please Please Me, I Want to Hold Your Hand, From Me to You, all demonstrated the power of audience interaction and their direct involvement in the music. That reaching across the barrier between the vinyl and the listener and creating some semblance of a connection can have a greater emotional resonance, even if the music isn't that good, but it does stick in your brain. Luckily for the Beatles, the music was always good, but the math still always works out the same. So Paul is the one saying, let him in. He's the one on the inside, letting us in. We are on his side, he is drawing us in, he wants us to come in, we presumably, you know, you've bought the album, you want to come in as as well, and he's the little Pied Piper in the song. It's an ode to the audience, you know, to us. I mean, talk about songs to massage your ego. You know, there's this real relaxing shoulder rub quality to it, you know. It's very inviting, it has that homely atmosphere, it, it, it evokes all those feelings, and, you know, feelings that were perfected in songs like Mrs. Vanderbilt and Picasso's Last Words, whereby Paul fosters this warmth and intimacy and a sense of inclusivity than if Paul was simply just singing directly about his family or singing to the band or just to one, one particular person. It's a song for everyone. This is a new era of Wings, and this is an album of family and friends and the, and the theme of family, like that critic kind of oddly pointed out is one that stretches all the way back to the likes of McCartney One and Wildlife. So it's no surprise to see that Paul is able to use this emotive carrot and stick with such a masterful stroke. Paul lists a cornucopia of characters like uh, Uncle Ernie, who is a reference to a character Ringo Starr played in the Who's rock opera Tommy. Auntie Jean was his actual aunt. Brother Michael is a, a nod in song to his musical brother Mike McGear from The Scaffold. Phil and Don are Phil and Don Everly of the famous Everly Brothers. Which is probably Paul's lamest shout out since he's one to Jimmy Page on Rock Show in Venus and Mars. Even Martin Luther makes an appearance. 
Whether this is the notorious Protestant reformist or Dr King the civil rights activist is anyone's guess. But the point is, is that anyone can come along, including us. Much of the song, much of the writing around this song seems to focus on how, you know, this being an autobiographical entry in the McCartney songwriting catalogue makes this song a rare thing. But if you actually check out the entire list of songs that he's done, there are quite a few. You know, the man has been writing songs for over 40 years now. We have songs like Penny Lane, Dear Friend, Eat at Home, Bluebird, Man We Was Lonely, e Every Night, arguably Single Pigeon, and you know, Elements of Little Lamb Dragonfly, and many, many more songs all draw upon and contain real elements of McCartney's life from one degree to another. Yes, there's nothing as frank or as in your face as Lennon's mother, but McCartney, for all of his front and macaganda, is a surprisingly private man, and we should be grateful for what, for what we get, really. Because he will only really use this skill, he'll, he'll only use this experience in only if it's in a way that doesn't overtly reveal anything unwanted or untoward to the public. But if it doesn't, hey, why not? If he helps him sell his music, brilliant. Who knows how many other songs were rooted in real-life events but were either too private or awkward to mention in an interview with Enemy or Melody Maker. Let Him In has some great Uncle Albert horns which return to fantastic effect. It's got that classical English feel to me, like I say. There are these, there are these interludes that come in in the instrumentals that have this great booming stomp to them, like this elephant-esque McCartney grandeur that the song suddenly injects. Just means you're, you're sent inside this swirling, rousing, riling atmosphere. And it wonderfully contrasts the very calming and simplistic lyrics and, and the way they're sung. You know, this is the opening song. Of course, it's going to have that top-notch McCartney production, as always. What I do find very interesting also is the decision to take the brass element the next step further, uh, kind of carrying on that militaristic feel by adding a layer of military marching drums, uh, adding the rudiments during the more swelling moments of the song, like in the middle eighth and the outro. This mix with the flu or the pipes or whatever, all working together, create this almost semi-American uh, Civil War infantryman's march sound. Eventually, the smooth and silky piano coders that brought us in sl are slowly replaced by this like rhythmic marching step, and the song kind of fades out. And is it is it McCartney leaving? Are we are we leaving? Are we leaving together with him? I'm not sure. You know, is I hope Paul's not heralding our doom or anything. Or it's a it, it's a bad omen. Maybe I'm reading too much into it. You know, what's weird is that it's not just the uh, a generic fade out. Fade outs are one of the most decrepit things in music. It's one of the laziest ways to end a song. There are, there are so many brilliant Tom Waits songs that are squandered with by a pointless fade out. It's like, did, did you not take the time to just, just think about a way to end the song a bit more inventively? And Paul gives us a fade out on this song and then whoosh, bam, there's a big fake out at the end and it goes bam, bam. And Paul, just because you, you fake us out with a fade out doesn't, you know, excuse you for the use of a fade out to begin with. Figure out how to end your bloody song, because this is a bloody good one. The harmonies in, in this song are probably some of the best the group do on the album. Like, it's really up there with stuff like Band on the Run in terms of those dexterous and wholesome layerings that make up the wings' robust sound. I love Denny Lane's backing vocals during the outro as well, you know. Open the door and let him in. Again, the group vocals also go into that feeling of inclusiveness and family that we just mentioned. And the fact that it's a group of people who are, who are literally as well as conceptually in harmony, they're harmonious, goes on to reinforce that this is somewhere you want to be. The Grammy Award winning soul singer Billy Paul reached number 26 in the UK charts when he covered this song, so you know, it kind of was a mild success. But I feel like you could be forgiven for not having heard it before, and for me at least it just sounded like a, a slightly pathetic hypothetical Jackie Brown cover. However, when I went to the inevitable YouTube version of the song, one of the comments on the YouTube page actually uh, struck a chord with me, slash made me burst out laughing. Uh, a guy named Keith Evans from over a year ago called this cover by Billy Paul one of the most groundbreaking pieces of music of all time. Uh, all right, guy in the comment section, calm down, please. Now, the sitting inside me that objectively knows that this is the superior song of pretty much the whole of side one makes me think that the placement here is just Paul saying to the listener, saying to the world, look, I can still write a hit song, but anything's possible. It's carte blanche from here on out. Now, whether that is because Paul wanted a, a sense of mystery going into the album, or whether he wanted to shirk some responsibility of, the, of this more democratic album, is unknown. But what is certain is that Paul is making it known that, that anything he will attach himself to will always contain those one or two super high notes that will stand the test of time every time we buy one of these albums. It's a marketing ploy, if anything, because Let Em In is one of the two songs that allowed Wings at the Speed of Sound to coast by, to be as successful as it was, due to the fact that they were both massive singles. And whilst we will get into some songs that I think are really fun and have genuine merit, there's an obvious gap in quality that puts Let Em In in another league. 
something that just clicks about the song that lets you know that it's rock solid. It has aged tremendously well, just like oh so many other McCartney piano-led tracks. And it still has heft behind it. It still has an effect on me every time I hear it. And I do not dispute its place in, in history or its placement on The Wing's greatest record either. And also check out the version of this song with Denny Lane on vocal to see what c just could have happened if Paul had given away a good song. So after a Titanic opener like that, I wonder how Paul, uh, sorry, the newly populist parliamentary wings will ever possibly follow it. Well, to give you a short answer, I really don't know. This is The Note You Never Wrote. Gonna get a We've already mentioned a couple of times on the show uh, times where Paul demonstrates his inability to stay on the sidelines of a project or, for lack of a, of a better term, staying out of a song. The note you never wrote takes that one feeling... The note you never wrote takes that feeling one step further. Sadly, in the wrong direction. It's a shame I have to start off this particular section not actually talking about the song itself, but now Paul has decided to, you know, to be more democratic, but it is his decision, and he's giving Denny Lane a song here. And, you know, I'm a big fan of Time to Hide, but... I don't feel like, you know, this is going to be like Revolver, which is going to be designed to showcase George. This is not the album to showcase Denny. The main factor is that Paul is just not playing to Denny's strengths here. He's still he's still kind of just showing off himself again, really. Very much in the same semi-patronising way Paul would write Ringo's hit to make sure that he would have a song on the album. Paul has mercifully bequeathed a second song onto Denny. You know, second track of the album, no less. You know, it's big, it's brash, and it really gives him a chance to flaunt his vocal chops, but am I the only one here who thinks it's all for naught? Like, yeah, Paul, I get it. You may have genuinely felt in this time of equal opportunities that Denny would have genuinely suited this song, but it comes across less as a natural move for the band, and more like Wings' own version of affirmative action. Either let him write a second song on the album, or better yet, let him keep this one, and let him write two more. I guess Paul just can't let Denny have his cake and eat it. Then Lang would have had a 66% stake in his own output, rather than looking like he needs to look to Paul for material. The fact that Time to Hide is so genuinely good and clear-cut above this less-than-mediocre McCartney affair makes the fact that Denny had to sing it at all all the more degrading, really. Like, I know a lot of people out there, maybe not necessarily you people listening to this podcast, but the majority of people out there would not know or care whether Denny Watts' face wrote this song or not. I'm just a purist who perhaps has over-romanticised the idea of what Wings could have been and unnecessarily worked myself up over it, rather than just, say, accepting them for the McCartney vehicle pop band that they really are. That being said, I will never get over Hugh McCracken not being the lead guitarist, ever. Now, politics aside, how does the actual music hold up? Well, it starts off, I must say, with a surprise. Well done, album. Well done. The, the soundscapes presented at the start of this song are kind of like the next logical step on for the kind of space agey sounds that were playfully toyed with on Venus and Mars, whereby here it's used to make less uh, more of a, of a fun experience, but more of a tense and atmospheric effect. I'm generally on edge when this song starts. It's just a shame that it really doesn't go anywhere. Like the sounds that the band starts to explore here at the start of the song are really quite arresting for me when I first heard it, and I had a sense of okay, wow, this is really cool. I wonder where this is going. This could be something great. And this anticipation somewhat goes into my negative reaction of the song, as my projective hopes could never really be lived up to, and I was foolish for not just expecting another silly Macca songbook once again. Uh, I just get the distinct feeling that this song thinks it's a lot heavier, both in terms of subject matter and sound, than it actually is. There's seemingly very little reason that I can see for this being the second song on the album as well. It's, I mean, the fact that it comes in straight after Let Em In, one of the surefire hits of the album, makes its mediocrity stand out all the more. This is a real throwaway one, folks. I'd skip it. Certain songs, that, for some, may be completely inaccessible just because of how broad and inoffensive they are. However, for me, they can almost be instantly charming. But only because, by this point in McCartney's career, I can spot the chirpy little throwaway love tracks that, you know, kind of still have that core strength in medley a mile off. And this, of course, is one of them. This is She's My Baby. My baby, she comes out at night She's taking me by surprise She's my baby Like gravy down to the last drop Mopping her up, yeah, yeah She's my baby 
Like many songs on this album, this is one that I had to come back to before I could really kind of settle down and look at it for what it was. Because at first glance, this was going in the throwaway pile quicker than you could say mumbo. I mean, at first glance, what do we have here? We have yet another derivative McCartney love song. Not only that, but it's not even anything clever. It's just, she's my baby. Yeah, you can really see this one being an uphill battle for me, really, because I get how bad it is. I know it's unoriginal. I know it's got very little going for it. But that still doesn't mean I don't like it a little bit. Tell the truth, I wouldn't be a, as big a proponent for She's My Baby if not for the awesomely, insanely good bonus demo version on the track that was included in the special reissue of the album. It's one of those nice pulling back of the curtain moments where it's, it's just nice to see Paul at the piano crafting the song. It has a certain earnest simplicity to it and it is wholly innocent and ignorant of the McCartney studio machine, which means the true charm at the heart of the song that you know is still somewhat present on the whole album shine through here all the clearer. It also showcases that Paul is still adept at working from home, something that he will put to very good use indeed on the upcoming McCartney 2 album, which I fucking cannot wait to get to, folks. So, so what was lost in translation between this early demo of the song and the final product that ended up on vinyl? Well, simply put, like very much of Wings at the Speed of Sound, there's a smorgasbord of overproduction issues with this song that means it just loses that tenderness and emotion that was so prevalent on the original demo. The song's just too large in scale. It was a cute little ditty before, and now it's carrying way much more weight than it can manage. I mean, is it just simply a McCartney song that was meant to be on a McCartney solo album than a, you know, a Wings big band song? Very possibly, because the translation's very poor, and there's very little actual Wings as a collective on the song. Perhaps it's purely the sprightly, you know, do-do-do-do keyboards, but there's something about the whole production, writing and lyricism that just seems to be begging to be covered by Stevie Wonder, an artist who Paul will be collaborating with in just a few years' time. And I feel Stevie could just take this kind of beat and this kind of groove and do something a whole lot more interesting with it. Now, considering how glib Paul can be in his songwriting, you'd think that with a simple title like She's My Baby, he'd really kind of step things up for this one. Because this song is so basic that you'd almost see Paul expecting the lyrics to write themselves. But a certain phrase appears in this song that really I have to, I have to pick a bone with. It's so phenomenally forced and obviously crafted to fit a writing hole that Paul has written himself into that it almost single-handedly derails the song for me and single-handedly inspired one of the articles coming up on the McCartney blog, which will be the top 10 worst McCartney rhyming couplets. Yes, this will, this will be featured in said list. When he sings, She's My Baby, like gravy down to the last drop i keep mopping her up oh yeah she's she's my baby you just start like questioning mccartney's sanity and his ability to spot when he's getting a little bit too radio too like he's just getting a little bit too fond of that dopey british sentimentality here and it, it's a famously bad mccartney lyric for a reason but all in all all of this doesn't stop me coming back to she's my baby admittedly on my playlist it, it is the live demo version from paul mccartney's house but I can see how some people would like this song. It's very single pigeon, it's very English tea, and if you like that kind of thing, this is the Paul song for you. It's not the ultimate Guilty Pleasure Wings track, but it's certainly up there. The next song we have is one where I simply did not learn my lesson after the last song with love in the title, whereby I made a complete arse of out of you and me by assuming it would be anything other than something trite, silly, and forgettable, which this song is anything but. This is Beware My Love. Fortunately, this is where, for a short while at least, the album really starts to pick up in a big way because Beware My Love succeeds where many of the songs on this album fail because it adds one of the key ingredients that makes Maybe I'm Amazed, Monkberry Moon Delight and uh, songs like 1985 oh so memorable. Paul just gives it some fucking bollocks for a change. The raw energy and electricity on display in Beware My Love means this song has become a real oddity in the sense that none of the other tracks on this album come anywhere close to matching its intensity. Which is a shame because whilst this album can be seen by many people as the beginning of the end in terms of Wings taking that one-way ticket to Dollsville, USA, yet a song like this can irritatingly show those folks that the band could have, once again, put up something a little edgier, a little more rough around the edges, and something that might actually win over his dwindling teenage fan club. I mean, that fictional hypothetical album would still have songs like Let Them In and Silly Love Songs, but still, it could have been something that anyone could have called cool. But no, Beware My Love stands alone as a reminder 
that Paul once, not still does, once created songs like Helter Skelter and Smile Away. The song starts off with some really interesting kind of sea shanty type accordions wheezing and heaving into existence with their sharp yet melodious sounds. It really has nothing to do with the rest of the song, but I like it purely for its unique placement on a Wings record. And it sets the stage for the true song that comes fading in. Well, when I say true song, the kind of little groovy acoustic piano part that starts off the track is also another kind of little prelude to the main song, as it were. None of this features on the live versions on Wings Over America or that Paul would perform for many years to come. But this little bit of tension at the start, the opening part, you know, don't say found out, it's like almost like a little gospel section just to kind of secure the right tone for the song. Like there's a real kind of tangible danger and worry and threat to it. And you know that Paul's not here, so you know something big is coming, you know. This is literally a song that says beware and then it just kicks into the main part of the song we have paul doing giving us a tremendous performance he he really sells the message and the emotion of the song and he gives us a little hint of that voice he used to give us back in like 71 72 giving us long tall sally he really screams and shrieks giving us that beautiful little richard sound that as i will forever say is sadly not present throughout this entire discography and is certainly not present today but like I say, the song kicks in, and this is the song that we'll hear on Wings Over America. Doo, doo, doo. And it's just painfully strong. It feels like something that, that could have been taken off RAM. And, you know, the doo 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 has certain echoes of the same Space Age stuff from Venus and Mars again. But for me, it's also got a kind of a, a major Jeff Wayne's War of the Worlds vibe whenever I put the track back on. And it's just a, a good, heavy rock song. There's some fantastically swampy and surging guitar throughout this. Paul bangs away on the keys like there's no tomorrow. And there's just this energy, this energy that for some reason is not present on the rest of the album. It's almost like he had to sap the energy from all of those songs to put into this one. And it really pays off. Like this is possibly the great Lost Wing song. This could have been a massive radio hit. This is a song that shows people that Paul can make something edgy. He can make something a little bit daring. Yes, you know, there's not a whole lot going on lyrically in the song. You could, you know, you could say it could be accused of having very simple lyricism or that it really doesn't go anywhere. But, you know, I'd argue that it has a bare bones quality because it has a very basic objective. Just to stir up that emotion, to give us that warning, get in, get out before anyone gets hurt. And does what he needs to, to, to sell the warning that it is heeding. You know, beware my love. He drills it into your head. We've got some of that wonderful repetition that he demonstrates demonstrated on Red Rose Speedway. He's drilling this into us. And when Paul gets a good chorus, by God, is he going to get every penny's worth for it? One other thing I do like in this song is Paul's little fake stutter towards the end when he sings, be -be -be beware. Be -be beware. This is only a, of interest to me as a man with a stutter who is in turn a big fan of stuttering in other songs. Other favorites of mine include Ch -ch -ch Changes, Bar 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 -ba Baran, or My Ch -ch -ch Generation. In early demos for this song, kind of a little interesting little piece of trivia, was uh, an earlier take featured the late Led Zeppelin drummer John Bonham. And on this version, it's very similar in terms of its composition to the version that we get on Wings Over America and other live performances. We go straight into the, he'll sweep you up! Like, we've got all of that. But on this one, he's got like a much more of a, a deep, powerful growl, like he's throwing us into the deep end. And, you know, in terms of how this song stands up, it seems to be the only one that I can find on the whole album that completely escapes without a single scathing remark. There are some people who don't like silly love songs. There are people who don't like Let Em In. I can't find anyone who doesn't love Beware My Love. John Blaney, in his book Together Alone, we had him on the show, he said, Beware My Love. Beware My Love dispels accusations that Wings were becoming a group of disco-loving softies. And in Doug Pringle's review of the album for the Montreal Gazette, he says, Beware My Love is the only unqualified success on the album. It builds from a gentle, acoustic beginning that becomes the only truly electric song on the album. Brilliant words, Doug. Almost like mine. So yeah, Beware My Love. It's a fucking good song, but not just by Wings of Speed of Sound Standards, but by the whole of Wings discography. And it is a travesty that has never appeared on any of the Wings compilations. Even the bigger ones like Pure McCartney doesn't have this song and that needs to change. Jimmy McCulloch has so far been an interesting presence uh, and addition to the band since his introduction on the big and bold Venus and Mars. He landed it well, you know, getting a song onto the album even before this new democratically reformed Republic of Wings. And that was an album that launched a massive tour and it was a better song than several of McCartney's own contributions on that album. 
I'm looking at you, treat a gently lonely old people. So to say that the pressure is on for this one is quite the understatement. Put down the bottle, Jimmy. Lay down the smack. This is Wino Junko. Wino Junko can't say no. Wino Junko eyes will go. Bill Briggs bring a leak. He can't say no. Till you go down again. Till you go down. We've already talked about expectations a lot on the show and the impact they can have on the end product of an album and just how detrimental it can be if handled the wrong way. Now one way Paul attempts to negate this is by trying to do something different every time. That way there's always something fresh and even if it goes badly you can just drop the sound quickly and move on. I'm looking at you Mumbo and Karina Corey. So for Jimmy, having a second song was, going, was always going to be a big task and the frustrating thing about the song is that it actually did do something different musically though. What makes Wino Junko have such a, a deafeningly lesser impact than Medicine Jar and what holds the whole track back in general is that lyrically it's stuck in a bog. It is stuck in the same place as it was almost a year ago. Almost defiantly so. It's interesting when Jim McCullough says in an interview in 76 that with Speed of Sound we were definitely gathering our thoughts. Which is interesting because he seems to be displaying the exact same thought as he did on that last album. Maybe he's just so fucked up that he needs to recollect it again. And obviously, for those of you who don't know how the story ends, it's no secret that Jimmy McCulloch had a problem with both drink and drugs. And when you're under the kind of creative constriction of probably only going to get one song per album, then a little bit of variety would be appreciated. Like, Denny knows how to mix things up by now. Wano Junko concerns the ramblings and wanderings of the titular Wano Junko, a man who is hopelessly stuck in a cycle of addiction whilst stuck in a system where the authorities are just to sign their name and don't help. Again, no prizes for guessing who the Wino Junko is meant to be here. Now, one thing that was obvious about Medicine Jar is that it was, it was definitely working within the established modes of pub rock, stadium rock music, and borrowed heavily from many existing tropes. But when the subject was a bit fresh and edgy, it worked as a debut track. But here, you know, the borrowing of generic writing and hints of twee over rhyming becomes a little wearisome. Like, the lack of progression in his journey as a musician and as a songwriter obviously mirrors McCulloch's own ongoing uphill battle with all manner of addictive substances. And in some ways you can argue that musically, this was one of the ways he was crying out for help. Though, there really is one thing I will not forgive him for. I remember that there was this thread uh, or article online and it was showing the worst metaphors and analogies used by high school, secondary school English literature essays. And when Jimmy sings... Playing with fire, getting higher, higher than a nine-foot flame. I can't help but think, why so specific, Jimmy? Why nine-foot and not eight-foot flame? Have you ever seen a ten-foot flame with, and said, I can never be as high on smack as a flame that tall? Like, you know, I like the playing with fire bit, but it's just the fact that he forces this rhyme almost to make sure he gets a song on the album just irks me. Fortunately, Wino Junker has plenty of other things going on for it in terms of its musical composition department, as it were. And it's clear that hanging around with McCartney was started to rub off on McCulloch, as the song is much more ambitious in terms of its soundscape and musical direction. Now, whilst Beware My Love shows how heavy a direction McCartney himself could have gone with this album, the actual heaviest song on the album probably goes to this one. There's just so many weird things going on in this song. It's, it's a real oddball. There's this murky, muddy, heavy tone for the whole thing. Like, there's, there's hard rock in here, there's psychedelia, there's kind of a folky sing-along element to it. And they all work together surprisingly well, propping up this half-baked Wano Junko idea. And as we start to work our way towards the end of the song, the solos just start to shred. Jimmy does what he does best and kind of lets himself loose without McCartney's direct supervision. And it won me over. I remember trashing this one on the Twitter and not really giving it its fair due. Uh, it's kind of like an easy beating stick for Jimmy McCulloch, much like Cook of the House will be later. For me, at least, the chorus is very catchy, a lot more catchy than it deserves to be, and it does elevate the song somewhat. But it's the part where it shifts into the Till you go down, where it just starts to get like, What? Jimmy, I did not expect you to do this, and the fact that you've caught me off guard means I'm going to give you a, a passing grade for this song alone. And the outro is just out of this world it, it, it just picks up this momentum and you can't really, you don't know how you got to this point in the song when the song kind of started off with that you know generic Jimmy McCullough sound but it transforms and it transfigurates into this monster by the end and you're left very satisfied by the end so yeah 
Lyrically, I'm totally not surprised by what Jimmy was doing, but musically, it kind of wasn't anything I expected at, at all. He's really not like moving forward, but he's definitely broadening what he can do with music. And again, like Back to the Egg, which is an album that is kind of a, a mean tease as what could have been, this song is very much the same. Overall, is it a good song? No, but in the right mood, or in the right atmosphere, it's a fucking great one. So, from one song where the writer seems to be stuck dealing with issues from the past, we move on to another song where the writer seems to be stuck dealing with issues from the past. What we have next is the 1970s equivalent of Paul McCartney sending out a heated tweet out to the world in response to some aggressive trolls on his Instagram page and 4chan. This is Silly Love Songs. Okay, as with many songs on the show, there is a particular aspect of them where the production or an idea behind them or the lyrics that can seemingly become the factor, the only factor by which the song is discussed and the context which all of its discussion is based. You can go to any article, top 10 list, review, YouTube page, forum, and everyone will always talk about the one thing in, in terms of bringing up silly love songs, and that's the bass. Yes, this song is possibly one of Wings' greatest bass contributions to music of all time. Paul absolutely lets it rip. After many albums of seemingly kind of holding back on his bass roots, where he, he would kind of dominate songs with those brilliant riffs, you know, songs like Drive My Car or Hey Bulldog or Get Back. And here, he really gets to bring that melody in. Like, I have friends who hate Wings, they don't understand them musically. I can put on silly love songs and say, hey guys, just listen to the bass, and suddenly they get it, suddenly they want to slowly work their way into the band. Maybe not immediately, but Silly Love Songs and its bass line is a great gateway drug to get people into Wings. Though, it's a shame that people only ever seem to talk about the bass in this song because the rest of the song is equally as interesting. Essentially, the song, you know, very much like Wings at the Speed of Sound itself, became a sort of microcosm to Paul's critics, where the album, as a whole, challenged people who were accusing him of using Wings as a backing group. This song would be his way of silencing those who always thought that every time he released an album, they would have to bemoan his writing of what Lennon called Paul's granny shit. You know, you know those very twee, very me type songs that Paul will write forever. When asked about where the song came from, Paul had this to say. But over the years, people have said, oh, he sings love songs, he writes love songs, he's so soppy at times. I thought, well, I know what they mean, but people have been doing love songs forever. I'm like, I like them. And other people like him, and there's lots of people I love. So luckily enough, I have that in my life. So the idea was that you may call them silly, but what's wrong with that? The song was, in a way, to answer a lot of people who accuse me of being soppy. The nice payoff now is that a lot of people who I meet are at the age where they've just got a couple of kids and have all grown up, settling down, and they'll say to me, I thought you were really soppy for years, but I get it now. I see what you were doing. By the way, Silly Love Songs also had a good bass line and worked well live. See, even Paul can't refrain from talking about the bass line to this song. But oh well. Another possible origin for the story behind the song, you know, more an apocryphal tale as far as I'm aware, is during the semi-rekindling of his relationship with John Lennon in the mid-70s that we covered just a couple of episodes ago now, actually. There was apparently a phone call between Paul and John whereby Lennon personally took the mickey out of Paul and out of his music one way or another and is supposed to have said something along the lines of you think that people or the world would have had enough of silly love songs, which of course would go on to become the opening line of the song. Very much like Paul using the If I Ever Get Out Of Here line from George for Band On The Room. Whilst I can't find hard evidence for this, the idea isn't unbelievable at all. Paul is known to take real speech and slip it into his songs wherever possible. And if this tale is true, then perhaps, you know, this is just the last open letter song that Paul wrote to John just before his death four years later. Who knows? I think it's just great how the song can be both seemingly so hyper-meta and self-aware of what it is and its own artifice. Like, everything you need to know about Paul McCartney, well, at least, you know, the 1970s Paul McCartney, is delivered in Silly Love Songs in one fell swoop. The song has dynamic and inventive, memorable melody, coupled with seemingly vacuous McCartney lyricism, great harmonies, stellar production, as always. And it may just have a little more wit than first meets the eye. 
Then we also have those wonderfully mellow and dreamlike breakdowns where the things shift into a slower little rhythm and Paul and Linda create these cute little counter melodies that dance and flirt seamlessly between each other, you know. How can I tell you about my loved one? Ah, oh, she gave me more, she gave it all to me. And it, it's up there with the best harmonies from Ram, you know, songs like Uncle Albert, Admiral Halsey, for example. I'm sure Elton John was a fan of this song as well. One of the bonus tracks that appeared on the reissued version of the album was an ins- another insightful little demo of McCartney essentially trying to pitch a, l- a much larger version of Silly Love Songs, despite the fact that he has just a single mic and a piano. It's easily one of my favourite demos of all time, not least just to, due to Paul mimicking his future bass line and brass segments with his mouth, but also Linda's genuinely touching harmonies that she does live with him here, which only further you know, conjure the, the, the blissful home life images of the couple. But like, Paul just starts off literally, literally like... Like, it's really fun. It has this rough and ready feel that reminds you, again, of Ram, of McCartney 1 and McCartney 2, that great homemade quality, the lack of overly lush horn segments, excessive studio layering, and and overcomplication with just too many cooks that comes close to spoiling the broth of the final album version. The clarity of both the sound and emotion of the demo version creates something much more tactile, and I will forever bemoan its loss on the faffy album version that just seems to do too many things at once. But hey, it's some soppy Paul McCartney stuff, and people love it. I'm not going to argue with it for too long. To me, the album version and the single versions are both another one of those jet type Paul McCartney songs for me, whereby it's almost heresy not to fall head over heels for it. I get it, I really do. The song was massive, it was a huge single, it's an all-important musical statement from Paul McCartney, and it more than likely did the entire lion's share of the work involved with saving the album commercially. But as a piece of music, it really isn't for me. But it does do well live, it really, it, it really does. If Paul did this live and I was there, I'd love it. Again, I don't think Silly Love Songs is a bad song in any respect, but I do tend, but I do tend to find it a, a little bit overblown, a little long, and it fails to really resonate me beyond its surface level cadence. But yeah, come on, no spoilers. It's still going to go on our cannon fodder list. You know, this is there's really not much competition on Wings at the Speed of Sound, though you know its inclusion is more for you than it is for me. Up next is a song that I'm sure is a personal favourite for all third wave right wing feminists everywhere and offers an interesting insight into both the inner mechanics of Wings in 1975 as well as the relationship between Paul and Linda McCartney. I really wouldn't want to be their marriage counsellor but hey, I hope you're hungry folks. This is Cook of the House. I think it would have been really naive to think that even on this parliamentary album that that Paul would have let Linda write her own song. It's been four years since Linda had failed to score a vinyl stamping on Red Rose Speedway with her turgid holiday ditty Seaside Woman that would later be released under the pseudonym Susie and the Red Stripes. So it would be presumed that maybe she would have grown in confidence as a songwriter by now. But sadly, even last episode we mentioned how new bandmate Jim McCulloch brought her to tears over her ability to sing, play and write which only goes to show how little room for improvement there was to be during her tenure with the band. Now, I'm not saying that any of her songs were suppressed or even that she had any songs for these rush sessions to begin with, but you would have thought that after five years in a Grammy Award-winning band that you that she might have a tune or two to show for it, even if it's something that she wrote four years ago and bringing forth now, and that might give you a bit of a, an update or some jive. What Linda does have to show for on this album is horrendously shit, to say the least. Look, I don't mean to berate the dead, and Paul obviously loved this woman with all of his life. I love her harmonies. I love her vegetarian products. I think she was a great activist. And, you know, I did kind of sort of defend this song when Howard Soons was was on the show, and, you know, he mentioned he really didn't like it. But that was more because I'm I'm pro-Linda than pro-Cook at the House, because I really do like Linda. But this song is just awful. So we start off with something shockingly rather 
quite interesting. We begin with the distinctive crackle of oil in the frying pan, probably some sausages and some bacon, which is actually a pretty cool way to start off the song like this. It literally throws us into the kitchen environment. And who knows, maybe if it took its time or played with the concept a little bit more, it could have been fun. But no, we were just rushed off to the beigest of beige, 50s era Elvis knockoffs, swing rock with Boogie Woogie Jules Holland piano. Oh joy, this really is going to be a throwaway, isn't it? Yes, folks, it is. It would be no more than 20 seconds in before you had to consider this one as a write-off. Don't worry, Paul. I'm sure you're still insured, mate. The truly odd point about this song is, without a doubt, Linda's voice itself. Now, again, this brings up the point about room for improvement because she's a fantastic singer on Ram. She was great on Band on the Run and she wasn't too terrible when Wings were live during Wings Over America either. But her performance on this song is pretty tame to say the least. I mean, it's no Florence Foster Jenkins, but it does beg the question of, where is the woman who so brilliantly harmonized with Paul on Ram? Surely she could belt out the track, but no, despite being under Paul's guidance, it seems we are having none of that. It's back to Dol Linda droning on and on. Now, the thing is, we know Paul is a meticulous perfectionist and is an extremely strong presence in the studio and, you know, does have a general knack for picking good songs. So you have to wonder whether any of these absolutely pants decisions and choices about the song are Linda's at all. And lyrically, it's just completely derailed as well. Like, its lyricism is indicative of some of Paul's most derivative and unimaginative ideas about songwriting ever. It's clear that Paul has just gone for the classic song that rests solely on a catchphrase in which the song title is you know of course that's cook of the house it's like she literally said she was the cook of the house one day when the band was around for dinner it stuck in mccartney's head and he thought it was going to be some sort of hard days night slash eight days a week kind of classic phrase and made a song about it but yeah you know you kind of see how retroactively some people might be, might be uncomfortable with the notion that linda is being put into the kitchen but in paul's defense i must say linda several times in interviews over many years said she was a homemaker she did enjoy cooking for paul she didn't enjoy being that motherly figure for the band so i don't perceive there's any uh, cruelty or misdoing in this song though the song's not just restricted for her even Macca himself is relegated to the most dull bass line ever. Like, Paul, if you're going to pass off one of your songs to Linda, then why not write something that's really cool and dynamic? Like, I know you just blew our blue balls off with silly love songs. So, I know you, don't want, you, know, you want to do the exact same thing again, but anything other than this. And don't even get me started on what the rest of the band has to do. I mean, the rest of the band, God bless them, must have just done this as a favour to Paul, as a friend slash boss. Almost like it's the band's equivalent of looking after someone else's kid in the evening, or, or taking someone else's wife to the airport at 4am. Cook of the House also highlights the relatively hasty recording process that this song was recorded in. It's quite clearly the most basic of skeletons on the album for a song, and, you know, it feels like this was a, a demo where it was meant to be, um, you know, demonstrating what mode it was meant to be styled in. And it's almost like they, they heard this rough cut, went into the studio, bish bash bosh, got it out there. And the result is that the song feels so overwhelmingly rushed and hastily put together, despite the fact of how damn basic and routine it is. It's pretty amazing, actually. Like, it's so clear that the song was gotten out of the way by the rest of the bands really quickly, and there was clearly no enthusiasm for experimenting with it or retakes, dooming it to an existence of being a painfully mandatory filler song. That being said, though, what I will say is that I do have a real weak spot for bog-standard 12-bar blues and generic doo-wop tracks from time to time, and that I'm not wholly opposed to bopping my head to this one. I feel like the damage has long since been done by this song so it's okay to like it as long as you carry a kind of catholic level of shame the vocal melody is surprisingly bouncy and fun to sing along to despite the fact that i did have to look up the lyrics to even understand what the hell linda was singing and it is just essentially just a list of random ingredients but it has this kind of lightweight zaniness that really has a charm of its own and that's why it's on the album Again, very much like the note you never wrote or must do something about it, I just wish it was something a little more substantial. The song Paul has written for the band on this album, you know, the material he shares with his bandmates, seems to be his least challenging and safe. This means that even if they do have any agency at all about how these will sound, they ultimately will still have very little to work with in the beginning when it comes to making the song their own and making something interesting. I actually first heard this song on the delightfully bland, promiscuous Linda McCartney compilation album, Wild Prairie. Unfortunately, the rest of the album is kind of, you know, forgettable as Cook of the House, with not a single track doing anything close to stirring me. It was less milking it and more flogging a dead horse. 
no pun intended. Rather infamously, when Linda was indeed asked about her role in the kitchen, she, as the tale goes, is said to have turned to the journalist in question and said, My answer is always, fuck off. The best thing to say about the next song on Wings at the Speed of Sound is that it's clearly the superior Denny Lane contribution. Mostly for the fact that it's actually a fucking Denny Lane song. But yeah, sorry if that was a spoiler. But it's the truth, and it's the first thing that comes to my head if you were to mention the title to me on a TV game show quiz. This is Time to Hide. <laughs> I, Sam Wiles, the host of the show, am a big Denny Lane fan when it comes to Wings. I really am. I haven't got into the Moody Blues yet. I fully intend to, but but my favourite song on Band on the Run is No Words. And I put I Lie Around in my top three Wings tracks of all time. So it's safe to say I'm always ready and waiting for a good Denny Lane song. Anytime, any place. Now, in terms of his royalty check, I was pleased to have him sing on the note that you never wrote but in terms of a fan going through this album for the first time I was a little disheartened and, and I was worried it would be another Spirits of Ancient Egypt situation for Denny which as we discussed on the last episode was an admirable if somewhat forgettable effort. Now the end result is almost a perfect midpoint between Spirits of Ancient Egypt and No Words which even with some rudimentary math skills means we already have a noteworthy song in his career. It's just not, like, mind-blowing or anything. And that's the only real negative that I'm going to give you. Because I really do like this song. It's not a guilty pleasure, but it's not live and let die either. You know what I mean? And yes, I'm very well aware that I am biased to over-egg this song a little bit. Most because Denny Lane is from the same city that I'm from. Birmingham. And also, it's a legitimately good Denny Lane song on Wings at the Speed of Sound. An album that's constantly derided. So yeah, those are my biases. So the concept of the song is essentially, what if Danny Lane had greater control over his craft in the studio and could use session musicians as a tool to create his songs in the, in the true Wings McCartney way? Lane utilises a sound not too dissimilar from the brass brashness and driving sounds and arena filling guitar sounds that started on things like Band on the Run and were perfected on Venus and Mars and he executes it with a very similar method to create this very grand, very majestic feel that has a real weight to the very open and rather vulnerable lyrics that Denny belts out with vigour. Lane also displays a wonderful use of harmonies in this song and they remain to be some of my favourite from the album, by some margin. It's clear that McCullough isn't the only one who has benefited from an extended proximity to Mr McCartney. What's obvious even after one listen is that McCartney once again had a clear infection on Lane's lyricism in this one. This is no different to No Words or Spirits of Ancient Egypt in that sense. Remember what Denny Lane said originally? It's incredibly hard to keep Paul out of a song. The most telling example of Lane either working too closely with or just simply borrowing directly from Paul is in the second part of the Middle Eighth where um, Lane asks whether he will beg, steal and borrow which is the exact line used by McCartney in the song Tomorrow from Wing's first album Wildlife. I'll play a quick excerpt here. Either way, there is too much McCartney in this song and it does stop it somewhat from breaking out of the 7 out of 10 bracket going into the 8, 9, 10. Like, I get it, Wings is a band and I've just written an article that's going to be on the blog today at the time of recording whereby I'm going to be essentially saying how great the band is and how McCartney didn't have to do everything. Check that out by the way on the blog, paulmccartneypod.wordpress.com. But in the sense of fairness, since Paul had such control over the lion's share of the songs, there's a part of me that wishes either Paul would stay completely out of a few Denny Lane songs, or that Denny could, in turn, infect a few more of Paul's songs. Uh, Denny Lane did this to fantastic effect with the song Mull of Kintyre, which he has a direct songwriting credit in. I believe Linda did something too for Live and Let Die, where she wrote uh, a verse as well. The actual story within the song itself is a very classic rock and roll one. Um, throughout the course of the song, it's one of those classic runaway Bonnie and Clyde type tales, which is perfectly reflected in the tense and foreboding atmosphere throughout the song. Also, some of the best bass on this album that's not the over-commented Silly Love songs is in this song. And it's great to see McCartney do what he needed to do more, which was to bring his signature badass bass to songs that weren't his own and not to stick his nose in too much. There isn't anything, you know, terribly iconic here, but there's a proper dirty groove and beat to it. And it flirts with that rarely seen McCartney grunge sound that really makes you feel like you've gotten your money's worth if you'd, if you'd heard this live. Overall, Time to Hide is a song that, for me, 
doesn't represent the zenith of the band, but it also shows that this album wasn't exactly one of the worst either. And as I've said with many songs on the show, it's also a, a cruel little teaser as to a direction that the band could have gone in if maybe Denny had, say, a 25% stake in all decisions made. But obviously that's not what happened, and Paul will always decide to do silly love songs. Better luck next time, Denny. Up next is the song on this newly founded Democratic Republic of Wings at the Speed of Sound that will put the whole alien concept of collaboration and inclusivity to its furthest extremes. Yes, folks, if you're getting Act Naturally vibes, you aren't wrong. That's it. We're going to give the drummer a song. Richie Stark, eat your heart out. This is Must Do Something About It. Yes, I must do something about it. First things first, now unlike Denon Lane with The Note That You Never Wrote, I'm actually glad that McCartney gave this song to the drummer Joe English because not only was it interesting in terms of shifting the inner workings of the band input but it also actually created the better song. There is the alternate version of this song with McCartney on the vocals seemingly just before English was considered and the short version of this review of it would be that it's just so tepid. Like it's fine but... If Joe English manages to breathe some new life into a song, then your song's really not doing that well to begin with, Paul. Overall, I just feel like Must Do Something About It is surprisingly dull and old and tired. It's one of those McCartney tunes that you really feel like he's just written it on a Sunday afternoon and he hasn't gone back to the drawing board with it at all. I remember being by a sewage outlet pipe that spills out into this local canal where I cycle and I remember hearing the McCartney version of this song and I thought, oh, wouldn't it be funny to say that? It was a fitting visual metaphor, but it wasn't, so I won't. It is a fantastical historical resource, very much like the other demos for this album, that we can hear McCartney and the band working on the track with a completely different singer in mind. But somehow, surprisingly, the track is even slower and even less inspiring and whimsical. But it also kind of foreshadows the melancholic whimsy of London town, so maybe it's an evolutionary thing. And and it doesn't even feel like a, it doesn't even particularly feel like a wing song. This could be on any album with any band if you know, for the purpose of a generic filler. It's just so unexciting. Now Joe English gives what I call a very kind of stereotypical, generically competent, slight spark seventies vocal performance. He doesn't have a very unique voice by any means, but in all fairness, he's the only band member who was able to take some pre-written McCartney material and turn it into something different. Again, it's not that a massive jump in quality, but it's passable. You know, it, it goes from completely tepid to comfortable afternoon radio crowd pleaser. His voice is bright, it's confident, and you can really tell he's attempting to add the emotion necessary to, to sell this song that really wasn't there when Paul sang it. But he and Paul were wrong in assessing what type of song would be suitable for him. I feel like I feel like if the album had some more upbeat hits then there may have been room for a song like this, but this is just another slow track on a very slow album and it just makes it feel plodding. Like this would have been like I think English would have been great with a, a track akin to something like the one after nine oh nine that, you know, whilst being rather service, would have been a fun, fast rhythm dose of charm. But no, we we get this very plodding and pudgy blob of a song that kind of just lurches forward and it's going through the motions and we know where it's going to go and you're just waiting for it to end the song is much like the song is much like uh, the song is much like it's kin on the rest of wings at the speed of sound as it starts off with a rather arresting and weird electronic dirge that you know kind of drones out in this weird kind of new wavy way and i don't know why but i thought oh you know here we go we could have something cool again i'm in the zone pool and it's just english pining on about being on his own and making an effort to go out there and find the lover oh my god i mean the song has one of the most blatant showcases of mccartney's signature lame duck lyricism in the verse where english sings no one seems to need my vote no one has to change my note no one here to hold my coat oh what a day this is just pure mccartney mush trash designed purely to, to schlockily rhyme with a full sense of meaning behind it and to get us through the next movement in the composition I do try not to get too cynical with a lot of these throwaway McCartney songs, but it can just be so bad sometimes. I'm not joking, it's really second rate. And the fact that it decides to get stuck in a loop and not develop at all just stifles it further. I'm not asking for Eleanor fucking Rigby or anything, just do something. Listen, I will listen to the song on this album. It 
does work in the dynamic of the whole album as we've discussed on the show many times before you know there are, there are songs that work better on the album completely fall apart when asked to stand up on their own merits but you know alone this one bears very little attention i mean it's hardly one of the best introductions to a new band member in wings is it i haven't read anything that that indicates that english was writing songs at the time or not but purely for the theme of the album and the sheer novelty of it i would have preferred an english composition but hey, at least a part of English makes his way onto a record, you know, to get something down before he fails the up sticks and quits before the next album. But yeah, Denny Lane took three albums to get his track on, so not sure what that says. For me, Must Do Something About It is a song that only has merit in the fact that it is the sole Joe English contribution to Wings, because aside from that, it's just a very stale offering. It fails to grasp any attention with its tired and well-worn tropes in both its composition and lyricism, and it's just an instant skip for me every time. I'm not sure if there's going to be a massive backlash to this review, actually. But hey, who knows? If you're the one person who likes this song, email the show up at paulmcontypod at gmail.com and let me know how I can enjoy this school assembly bore of a song a little more. The next track on this album answers the question that you and all of your friends were inevitably asking. What if Paul McCartney tried to write a song for a Tarantino Spaghetti Western? Well, this song does just that, folks. And yet it somehow ended up being one of the most pleasant tracks on the album. And one that I've been revisiting the most ever since. This is Sam Ferry and You've got a lot And from what you've got I'd say you're doing well, dear One of the higher points of McCartney's early phase solo career was his increasing experimentation with different genres and soundscapes. No, this isn't exactly the worldly Paul Simon preparing for Graceland or anything, but songs like Ramon, Bit Bop, Sea Moon, Loop the First Indian on the Moon did go some ways to show that McCartney's pretty comfortable taking on any type of music, though I'd love to hear Single Pigeon done in death metal. What we have this time is a return to Paul's mastery of the acoustic guitar, one of of the most overlooked parts of his career really. This kind of Latino, Mexicana influenced old western style mixed with that heavy brass George Martin soundscape was something that I was not expecting to wings to explore especially on this album. But the fact that it has something that makes it stand out, something unique, something cool, something fun that sets it apart, means it's, as far as this album is concerned, completely unforgettable. Though at this point I have learned not to become too attached to these kind of wing songs because they notoriously abandon any potentially interesting directions after one song. Again, see Ramon, Bip Bop, Sea Moon, Loop the First In on the Moon, etc. However, what that does mean is that the whole band's discography is scattered and littered with a dazzling range of quirky little tunes. But the flip side of that is that there is no real definitive Wings sound or image. What really piqued my interest in this song, though, was the fact that it had an uncanny resemblance to sounds and soundscapes of one other musician I also did a podcast about. I'm sorry, folks, I know I always go on about down in the hole my Tom Waits podcast far too much on this show, but I can never plug it enough, and I just have to mention that this song... You know, has a real weighty flair to it. I was actually going to mention this whilst reviewing Beware My Love as well, which too has that same sort of you know warped brass surging sound that just adds incredible speed and momentum to both songs. The main trumpet in this one almost duels against McCartney, and it slowly starts to go completely loco and starts shredding, which is a welcome addition of dynamic instrumentation and unfamiliar sounds done well. Again, especially for this album. I can't stress this enough. This song may not have been the genius track that I see is if it were not for its terribly lukewarm kin. Uh, lyrically, I thought this song had more going for it until I sat down and read the short word count of lyrics and I felt kind of dejected as, as it's just another kind of McCartney throwaway unfinished idea and it just kind of stinks of rushed in the recording sessions. Fortunately, the raw musicality and catchiness of the melody and chorus are more than enough to allow the song to comfortably work, especially on this so-so album. I really felt like the song should have ended the album as well. I mean, it ends on such a high note and it would have left people, you know, smiling really. And it's fun and interesting and unique and more importantly, it isn't something we've heard a thousand times before. San Ferrien really should be in the cannon fodder section of our show and I really want it to be, but I'm afraid there's just not going to be really any room, is there? Unless I really go against the fans, well, my, my three fans out there. But more on that in a moment. We have one last song. The last song we have left on the show is one that I've never heard of before, and I'm sure most, even diehard McCartney fans, have never heard of before. Even Stella McCartney has never fucking heard of this one. But hey, let's crack on with it. This is Warm and Beautiful. Love so warm and beautiful Never fades away Never 
this song for me unfortunately comes at the end of an album that taken as a whole has really not been that earth shattering and the way Paul decides to end this directionless and mixed bag of an album is with a weird mixture of songs like Here Today from Tug of War mixed with Golden Slumbers and I'll Follow the Sun and trust me if that combination sounds like it would have a good outcome for you it really doesn't this song is the ultimate cop-out of an ending to this album. Very much like Red Rust Speed, where whose infamous single disc lacked too lacked any direction or emotion. So, you know, McCartney attaches something faux artistic on the end to give it some semblance of an emotive closing chapter of an album. He does it again here. I know I slagged off Karina Craw on McCartney 1, our first episode, but at least it seemed there there was a genuine effort behind making it a piece of art. You know, I remember that quotation my here like firing the bow just to get that perfect sound this is just textbook mccartney at the piano singing about gooey lovey dubby british imagery it's really quite dull obviously there are some very george harrison light typey guitar movements and, and twangs in this song and it just feels like it's one of those songs there where the band was struggling to find any enthusiasm for it either no one really seems to be putting in there or there's no spark there's no spontaneity i expected all the moves to come and the vocal melodies go exactly where you expect them to and it's it, it, it's like paul's got a warm wet blanket and just wrapped it around you like it sounds like a good idea if you're cold but give it give it a minute it's gonna it's gonna start feeling really uncomfortable Obviously, taking into account the untimely death of Linda, this song does seem to take on a new meaning and significance that it may not have originally had. Uh, Paul would go on to rearrange and remake the song for a string quartet in a series of memorial concerts for his then late wife. And you can hear this, I might go as far as say, superior version on the 1999 album Working Classical. Oh, and the fact that this song is included on the compilation album Pure McCartney when Beware My Love was not is fucking mind-boggling to me and a crime. Now that we've come to the end of the album, we have to get onto the business of deciding which songs have to drown and which songs get to climb in the lifeboats. This is, of course, the cannon fodder section of the show, where we seek to pick the cream of the crop from every McCartney album, and by the time this, this podcast finishes, in 2025 or something like that, um, we will, in theory, have the ultimate bare-bones, need-to-know guide to McCartney's entire oeuvre. Now, is it fair that I only picks three songs per album, and that many classics don't make the cut? No, but that's what makes it fun. I've been hinting today that two of the songs, uh, Silly Love Songs and Let Em In, are sort of auto-includes for this segment, but I'm not so sure. Um, the first one I picked is, indeed, Silly Love Songs. It's a wonderfully catchy tune. I know a lot of people love it. It's not my cup of tea, but I can see why it's so big. And even the horrible cynic like me is completely powerless to that bass line. Yes, it really is that good, Paul. You do have the right to bask in the, in the glory of it. The next song I'm going to pick is San Ferian. I didn't speak too long about this one because I just had nice things to say about it, really, and I don't particularly think it's that interesting for you, the listener out there, to hear me drone on about songs I like. But San Ferian, it's quirky. It's got a different texture to it. It's got a different locale to it. You know, you know, Wings went to Lagos, but they didn't make anything that sounded like they were from Lagos. And they went to Abbey Road for this album, and they created something that, that sounded like it could have come from South America. And the fact that it also has certain elements of Tom Waits also helps it makes its way onto this list. Now, for my last song, uh, I'm going to be a little bit controversial. I'm not going to include Let Em In. I know a lot of people are going to be r- r- spitting coffee at their monitors right now and dropping their iPhones in shock, but I'm actually going to pick Beware My Love. Like I say, this is the forgotten McCartney tune. I play this song so constantly. It's a very motivating track. It's great when I'm cycling. It's great to you know, get me pumped up. I love singing it, and I wish more people had heard it, and I'm going to make sure people have... And I'm going to make sure more people hear it by putting it on my Cannon Fodder segment. So again, we're going for Silly Love Songs, San Ferian, and Beware My Love. The other songs can go fuck off. Note, I was genuinely considering putting Cook of the House in there just to be controversial. I resisted. So there we are, folks. This this is the end of our eighth episode now. And I must admit, it was a bit of a slog. This podcast actually took five separate recording sessions to do. What with uh, Noisy Neighbours noisy babies dogs food breaks dinner breaks phone calls oh my gosh it's it, it's just been ridiculous i know it's taken a long time to come out this one but it's out now i hope you enjoyed it more than i enjoyed this album uh wings at, at the speed of sound is definitely a rush product that lacks that final sheen of something like band on the run or venus and mars or even the red rose speedway for christ's sakes like this album really feels thrown together the songs except for putting let them in at the start and Warm and Beautiful at the end feel like they could just be jumbled in any old order and they still have the same lack of 
cohesion. I feel like when the band saying they were going for that relaxed feeling that they meant they were trying to translate that sense of relaxation onto the audience but unfortunately what it results in is a lacklustre experience for everyone because it feels like they're just not putting in their their all like i know they're tired from doing a doing a world tour but if, if you're gonna put out a bad album then just don't do an album or write a bunch of songs and then release an album after wings over america is done the fact that they've made it in this unfortunate gap does make me feel a little bit cynical about the whole thing anyway like this was never destined to be an album they just kind of churned it out and that shows there's not enough hits there are one too many duds for me and whilst i like them the singles for this album were some of the most uninteresting for a while i can't say anything more than that really thank you folks thank you for listening to this episode of paul or nothing we are the world's premium paul mccartney podcast the place to get all your paul all of the time remember if you want to get in contact with, with the show i would absolutely love that i'd love to read out your correspondence i'd love to hear what you have to say if you've heard from paul if you've met him if you play his music if you're an inch <laughs> if you're an instrument if you play an instrument, if you have any weird little anecdotes or trivia you'd like to share, or maybe you'd just like to tear me a new one, please email us at paulmccartneypod at gmail.com. Contact us on the Twitter at McCartneyPod. There's the blog. We've got two new articles up for the blog right now. One where I discuss Red, Red Rose Speedway and how it would work as a double album, and one where I talk about the top non-McCartney contributions to the band. The next article at the time of recording will be me discussing the songs that Paul wrote to John Lennon specifically and and how they work and what they mean. And last but certainly not least, please folks check out the Patreon page. The Patreon page is the best way for you to help out the show. I'll be putting links in the description. Obviously, I would really like to push this one as much as possible. I've already gotten my first donor, which is our good friend of the show, Mr. Tom. I'm sure he'll mention that when we have him on for the next episode. But yeah, if you want to see the show grow, if you want to see us have better audio quality, better guests, a wider variety of content, check out the Patreon page at www.patreon.com slash McCartney podcast. That's the end of this one, folks. Next week, we will be with my friend Tom Quee, who I literally just mentioned. It's It's been a right faff getting all of these episodes out. So yeah, I'm sorry about the admin there. I'll be more prompt in future. But on that note, folks, stick around. I can't wait to talk about Wings Over America. It's possibly one of my favorite Wings albums ever. Thank you for all of your time, folks. Thank you for all my listeners out there in America, in England, in France, in Deutschland. Uh, I don't know how to say Russia in Russian, but I've seen the metrics out there. I've got people in Africa, South America, Australasia, Asia, everywhere. I'm so glad I've been able to reach so many of you. Please write in. I'd love to hear all of your stories. Maybe even Paul specifically means something to you in your country. Anyway, folks. This podcast would not be possible without without you. Please check out all the links that I've plugged. Check out the blog as well, the Twitter. I'm not going to pester you anymore. Podcast's over now. You're free to go. Go out, go home, go outside, do what you like. Have a great day. But always, most importantly, keep listening to Paul. Keep listening to the music and spread the love. Peace and love, peace and love.